Welcome to Ephesians chapter 6 and to the midweek Bible study for this week. Glad you're with us. This will close us out in the book of Ephesians. Looking forward to going over this with you. Thank you for all of you that write in and your encouragement. Patrick at rsafeharbor.com is my email. Also, uh, rsafeharbor.com is our website. So go check it out. We'd love to have you view our worship and be a part of what we're going through. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. We are, we are really amazed at what God's doing there. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. And again, as we always say, thank you for giving. But if you have a church, a local church where, that is leading you and feeding you, they probably are relying upon your gift there. So we never ask you to, to hurt yourself. Give where you're led and fed and still be a part of us. And just watch us and send in encouragement as you wish. That works for us. All right. Um, Ephesians 6. A little episodic is the way we treat it. But please remember, it's a whole theme of this love, humility, respect, submission. It is constant throughout this book. So whenever you, whenever you just take one section and you bring all that submission to it, it can be offensive. But when you look at the whole, you begin to understand what Paul's trying to do here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, rather bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Let's take a look at this in two sections. The first three verses. Children, obey your parents, uh, honor your father and mother. So many questions I get about this, uh, mainly from adults. And these are adults who have abusive or uh, difficult parents that are still horning into their life and are saying, how do I honor them when they're just complete reprobates? Or whenever they are, they come in and they insult my family or my wife or like, well, first of all, if you're a guy and anybody's insulting your wife, even passively aggressively, you, you step in. You don't let mama do that, ever. Your wife is the most important woman on the planet to you, period. If mama tries, mama is going to slide way down the list. And it's the only way, that's what we are. When you marry, when you marry somebody, that's your family now. Everybody else are your relatives, but your family is who you married. Then you get babies and that's, if you get babies, uh, that's quite a blessing, a little extra. But um, children obey your parents is talking about children, not about grown children of parents, but children. So obey your parents in the Lord. Now we were always told that in the Lord. So if you're, and, and that's correct. If your parents were to tell you to go over there and kill the dog, uh, your neighbor's dog, no, you don't do that. Uh, if they were to tell you to steal something, no, you don't do that. You, um, and again, that's if you have a choice. There are many children that have zero choices in life. And as Christians, we need to find them, care for them, protect them, love them, house them whatever we can do to help. We must care about life from its, its inception all the way through to the grave, and we need to be consistent in that. That said, uh, it, it is the first commandment that comes with a promise to it, and that is that they would have a long life in the land that God was given them. Well, of course, that was referring to the Israelites as they went from Egypt to the land of Canaan, where they would be established by God and the 12 tribes and the like. He's saying, you obey your parents and it will go well with you. And that's generally true. Uh, it's generally true. Most of us don't have parents that are monsters. All of us have parents that are imperfect and we deal with that. But that's only fair because all of our parents had children that were imperfect. So we deal with that. Something I, when I work with teens that I, I do bring up to them is that yes, you didn't get the parents you wanted, but they didn't get the kid they wanted either. We all get through life by negotiation and the grand dance of love and submission. We can do it. But then this next part, this, this is hard to translate. 
So some of the older versions would say, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Here, the NIV goes with, fathers, do not exasperate your children. It is a hard, hard thing to translate, and it's a hard concept as well. It comes down to this, do not overburden your children. Do not push for perfection. Do not fall on them with shame. Now this can come in many ways. Um, I've seen it happen with grades, where if a kid got less than an A, got an A minus, the parents were furious. The parent didn't let the kids play because they have to be, they have to get into a good school. I think many of us are finding out that university education didn't do for us what we thought it was gonna do for us. And instead there were a lot of debts and now we're walking around going, we need to rethink this. You know, universities are still fantastic and still very necessary for professions. But I think over the last few years, we've all had a, another look at this. And Mike Rowe, I've listened to a lot of his stuff. Um, I always enjoy his stuff, even when he disagrees with me, how dare he? I still enjoy his, uh, the way he thinks. But we can pressure them for grades or very common uh, to hear parents yell abuse during sporting events at their kid and at the umpire and at the coach. I have, um, I've just been appalled. And there was one time uh, about a year ago, maybe two years ago since COVID, I think maybe two years ago now, where a couple of us dads actually had to just go around and stand around the fella because he was going, he, his next move was violence. And none of us were intending to pin the man down. We just kind of wanted him to wake up to the fact that we all heard it and we weren't going to let this continue. And fine, as we stood there, finally a person that ran the facility came over and told me he had to leave. And he's yelling abuse all the way out. And some of the fathers are walking close by to make sure he didn't go into violence. What chance does that kid have? Any kid of that parent, what chance do they have? By the way, I've been exasperated at the treatment of some umpires toward uh, my grandson's team. And I'll see favoritism and I'll see bad calls. But I also have a, a grandson there that I need to protect him. From what? Not bad calls. You're gonna get bad calls all your life. I need to protect him by showing how, do you, how does a Christian react? We can disapprove of the call without being abusive, without being angry, without kicking chairs or throwing things. We can talk about fairness as something we only want when we want it. The other times we want grace. So let's not overburden the heavens with cries for fairness. That's another way we can you know, exasperate by that. We can exasperate by grades. Uh, we can call them idiots. We can whack them about the head. I mean, there are so many ways to mess up your kids. Good news is kids are amazingly resilient and they very often are able to overcome even our horrible job as parents. As long as you love them and you're trying, they generally can pick that up. But again, don't exasperate. Uh, I, I was exasperated a lot by my father and didn't know how to please. And I gotta tell you, it breaks a part of you. And I think that I'm doing great. I certainly don't want anybody's pity. God has blessed me beyond measure. So um, knowing that, let's, um, let's remember, guys, let's just be very gentle and kind. And be aware that the child you got is not the child you wanted, it's the child God wanted. And so while you might be mechanical and engineering, your child might be artistic, or your child might be athletic, or you might have been athletic, but they wanna be a bookworm. It, you let the child be who God wired the child to be. And that means, by the way, that I'm all in letting kids have wiggles kids have wiggles because God put them in there. Don't take out the wiggles. And if they make a little bit of noise during church, of course we teach them how to behave in crowds. 
teach them how to behave in restaurants. But any church where you cannot hear the voices of babies and children is a dead church because it is a one generation till extinction church. Kids, kids are fantastic. Gotta love kids. Well, then he goes in all and out. If you, now, if you listened last month to the four section, four part series on what does the Bible say about slavery, then you're not gonna be quite as angry as you would be if you didn't listen to those and you come upon this. Slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. In the Old Testament, slavery was codified. It was put into law of the land by God because they were being moved to a land. And again, I will direct you back there for all the explanations. In the New Testament, we would love it if Christ and the apostles stood up and said, no more slavery, slavery's wrong, slaves get out of there, masters release. But the fact is Christianity came, was born into a, uh, a world in which it had no power and there was a law of the land that was not written by God, but was written by Rome, it was written by Mongols, it was written by all of these other different people, but not by God. There wasn't going to be a land in which Christians lived. They were going to be living everywhere. So what were the rules? It was very, very consistent that even if you're a slave, you are to be honorable, you are to do well. And if you are a master and you're a Christian, you are to treat the slaves as family. We have a book in the Bible called Philemon. Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who uh, took off, ran away. Onesimus became a Christian and Paul became friends with him, wrote Philemon that he was to receive back Onesimus because the law was Paul couldn't keep Onesimus or there was a death penalty for both of them. So I'm sending him back, but because he is your brother, you treat him not as slave, but your brother. There are even carols that we sing over Christmas that talks about how the slave is our brother. Well, we need to remember this. And therefore, they're, they're a family now. And they're no longer, this, by the way, nothing in this okays any aspect of antebellum slavery in the United States or elsewhere. Not, it's nothing like that. This is an entirely different culture and people, different set of rules. I, what, there's no way you can justify what we think of when we think of the term slavery. Again, I implore you to go back and listen to those four. And again, it talks about what, what's going on. Husbands submitting, wives submitting, all of us submitting to Christ, children submitting, fathers submitting, slaves submitting, masters submitting. Are you getting the, the theme? And why should we have to do all of this? Because as Paul said in the last chapter, these days are dark. There are hard times coming and hard times already exist. And that is true no matter what generation you live in, no matter what period of time you live in, that's true. So better buckle up. And that's the last part of this chapter. Finally, and this has launched a thousand VBSs, Vacation Bible Schools, or in Britain, Holiday Bible Schools. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Wow, do we have a lot to unpack. We'll do it briefly, since we have a job to do today uh, to finish our chapter, but we'll do it enough to where I think you'll, you'll get the, 
the gist of it and what you need. And the Holy Spirit will take it and do with it what he wants. We need to take our stand against the devil's schemes. We often wonder what the will of God is for our life, but we also need to remember that the devil has a plan for our life as well. And the devil has schemes. And the universe is a very big place and not everything out there likes us. So we need to armor up, buckle up, get ready. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual forces behind evil that bring evil to us. It's about the warping of creation. See, that's something about the devil. The devil cannot create. He's not a maker, he's not a creator. All he does is warp what's there. For example, uh, the devil didn't invent the internet, but the devil sure flooded it with pornography, hatred, with uh, attacking each other politically and personally. The devil did not create sex, but he has certainly played with it and perverted it. He did not create money, but he's played with it and perverted it. He didn't, uh, how about personal property? This, you, you get the point. The devil likes to mess with things and warp them. Husband and wife relationships. I mean, we, we can go on like this forever. So how do we fight? Well, the first thing Paul says is, you're not fighting flesh and blood. The neighbor that has gone out of their way just to be a real pill and a thorn in your side, it's not your enemy. I know it's hard, but they're not your enemy. The power behind them is. So do not look upon anyone as your enemy. At worst, they are prisoners of your enemy. They may just be influenced by your enemy. And it could be that they've not had enough people of light around them, which is what we're supposed to be. And it may be that we're not shining like we're supposed to shine. Again, this powers of the air and all the other, these were Jewish ways of talking about the uh, spiritual evil that is behind the evil that we see in the world. Therefore, since we're not fighting against flesh and blood people, but against evil forces, and, and the manifestation of evil in our world. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. My father is a very imperfect man, as am I. My imperfections are different from his, uh, but I, I cannot pretend that, that I am not a man with imperfections. But my father taught me some really valuable things. The greatest gift I think he gave me was the ability to stand alone. Regardless of what anybody else does, stand. If this is what you've marked out, this is who you are, this is where you've drawn your lines. Stand, even if nobody will stand with you. I was very, very blessed whenever people rushed to stand with me a year and a half ago. And I'm still blessed that they're still there and so many others are, are there as well. It means, means everything. I'm very grateful. But that's our job. Stand. Don't let others push you out of the way. Don't back up and run away because nobody's standing with you. You do what is right because it is right. You do it in love. You do it in gentleness and patience, but you do it. And God will have the victory. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Back then, uh, you usually had one garment and you would then cinch it up with a belt. And if you were going to, do, to run, you'd pull the, up the, the garment a bit and tuck it in the belt, cinch it. If you're gonna be working, you do it a different way. Uh, the kilt that a lot of folk in Scotland have worn in history and is still worn, you know, military or, or weddings or the like, um, that originally was just one big long piece of cloth that was wrapped around a person. And those pleats that you see in the kilt are, are actually just distant echoes, maybe even manufactured echoes, because a lot of that was ancient tradition that started in the 1700s. 
Um, but in the old days, it, those pleats were really, because you had the belt and you'd tuck them in. And then at night, that was your sleeping bag slash tent. It was also your pockets because you would bow out little bits and cinch that in your, your belt. You could store your porridge or whatever you needed down in there. That was very similar to what Jesus and his apostles would wear as well. So he's saying, don't let it be loose and flappy right now. You need to cinch up and be ready for movement. Always be ready. So that when the day of evil comes, you can stand your ground. Keep truth buckled. Truth is what's going to keep you ready. And that's why we do the Who Told You About series. That's why we're so open about our study. Um, and yeah, that, that does get criticism, but that's okay. Uh, it gets an awful lot of thank yous as well, frankly. So we'll, we're, we're just going to do it because we, want, we don't want to die for something that's not true. We want to live for what's true. So, then breastplate of righteousness in place. People are going to take shots at you. So, the best thing to do is to, to not hand them ammunition and the gun by doing stuff that they can then use to turn against you. Now, of course, people can turn good against you, but you know what I mean. If we give them an opening if you give the devil an opening, he'll take it. So we need to be righteous people. And again, I hear people think, but I'm not very righteous. I get that. Do you know what the Bible says? It says Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him as righteousness. Faith in God will strengthen this. No purity, we're probably not gonna become pure. We try and, and so we should, but we polish up the breastplate getting it strong and ready by our faith in God, our reliance upon Him. And then your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Um, armies were generally barefoot until the Romans came along and other professional armies. Um, the Egyptians, to a point, uh, the Greeks and the like, they figured out that you can march a lot further if you've got shoes on. And so sandals, were very often replaced by shoes that you could cinch up again because sandals are a little hard to run in. You know, if you have, you have flip-flops, trying to run away from the law is not a good idea. I think we've all seen that on the television. So uh, again, get ready to move. Why? Because following Christ is a movement. If your church got stuck in 300 AD or 1960 AD, that's not what God wanted. It's a movement. Keep it moving and be ready to move. But it also means this. Here I am, I'm standing. But then I learn something. Maybe I hear from you a story about your life and I'm going, I'd never thought of that. That's new. And then the Holy Spirit works on that story and then I look in scripture and I see something I hadn't really noticed before. I need to adjust. Paul says, keep your feet ready to adjust when God needs you to adjust. When my son was in the Marine Corps, uh, his training battalion was known as machines. When it came to drill, they were incredibly precise. Now, you might watch drill and wonder, what's the point? They are never going to march like this in war. All of these lines crisp and then suddenly stop, turn this way, stop, do this, everything, absolute precision. They're never going to use this, is what I've heard some people say. This is our old, outdated Napoleonic stuff. No, they're learning how to work as a group, unquestionably obeying without looking to see what the others are doing. You hear the command, you do the command. You're ready to move without looking around saying, why should we move? What's the point? What are they thinking? Where are we really going? No, you be ready to move. And so God wants you ready to move when he's ready to move. You don't just move for movement's sake, but when he's ready, you go. We often talk at our safe harbor about let's move at the speed of love and at the speed of the Holy Spirit. 
If he moves, we move. If he stays, we stay. But let us keep our eyes open so that we know what one he's doing. Now, we don't want to outpace or lag behind. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world, is the old hymn. Uh, faith, faith is hard for some people. I'm, I'm one of those. I've been around giants of faith that just, uh, they stagger me with their faith. Whereas, not every day, but very often I have to really struggle and have some serious talks with God and wrestle with him down by my own river, Jabbok. Uh, you Bible people know what I'm talking about. It is something which, however, I need to keep always up there in the way of anything coming in. When someone throws something at me to think, all right, I believe in God. Remember the two rules, two facts of the universe. One, there is a God. Two, I'm not him. So how do I deal with this? Faith. Like you, like I would assume everybody watching this or listening if you're listening to podcasts. I have lost friends to COVID. I've got a couple of friends that are right on death's door right now. And I've lost friends to cancer. In one year, two of my best friends died cancer. The year before then, one of my best friends died, young man, heart attack, out of nowhere. This week, and this will be about a month ago by the time you hear this, because we record early, just so if I get COVID or something happens, we can have this, um, you can still have this material. We try to get ahead of things. But this week, a good friend of mine, younger than me, just dropped dead. I, there's no indication of what happened yet we can get angry and we can look at God and go, what is the point? By the way, he'd much rather you wrestle with him than not, because if you're wrestling with him, at least you're in contact with him. So you, you do that, but keep that shield up. I believe he's there. I believe he's good. I believe that Jesus is his son. So how do I handle this? Without explaining away or leaping into Pollyanna land where everything is just lovely. How do I deal with the right reality? You got a shield because you're in battle. Keep the shield up. Then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit. <laughs> it's not used to whack your enemies with. It's not the big shillelagh or Irish hawkthorn club. Um, it is, uh, it's no, it's the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is our only weapon. And what is our weapon? The spirit of God. What does the spirit of God do? Leads us to be more like Jesus. What was Jesus like? Love. Love is our weapon. Our helmet is salvation. Helmets were there to just keep you from the death blow. Our salvation keeps us from the death blow. We know we're going to be with Jesus. We know we are saved. Going into battle knowing that you will win in this world or in the next is a big comfort. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Yeah. Remember how those songs, we talked about that last week, how they come back? They really do. They come into play here. And we pray in the spirit. That's our weapon, it's our force, it's our energy, and it's also how we pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Have you ever been around a, a, a family and they let the, a, a little kid say the prayer and the kid names everybody in there and then distant aunts and uncles and then they start naming everything on the table you know their eyes are open, but that's okay. I pray with my eyes open. Um, I, I find it delightful. After a while, the long list of names becomes quite a bit, doesn't that? So what do we do? Keep praying. God knows your heart. And you can, some, there are times I just say, be with my family. Be with our safe harbor and all of those that 
tune in, listen, give, or who are a part of it, sending in videos, however they're a part of this, protect them. We pray. When storms come through, I pray. We pray for the people of Kentucky and people of Waverly, Tennessee, the people of, um, of Panama City, Florida, who are still suffering from the events of a hurricane years ago. Uh, people, they moved off the news and therefore people quit helping. We pray for them. We try to help them. Stay engaged, stay in the battle. And one of the ways we stay in the battle is prayer. If you, um, if you can, go back to January 9th, the Sunday worship on January the 9th. And in there, there's gonna be a video, just a few minutes long, from a pastor named Justin Walker, who's pastor of Revive Community Church up on the Ohio River in Northern Kentucky. And he has, a, a brilliant devotion about prayer that I think you would you would really find useful in this context and rather than trying to repeat it uh, I think he says it better than I would so go look January 9th Justin Walker it's right in there you'll find it easily and you can scrub forward and back with your finger you know how to do that right and then he goes pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth words may be given me so I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it as fearlessly as I should. Um, Paul during this time, it is often thought, was under house arrest. Uh, and that may be the chains he's talking about here. But it also could be a metaphorical because he starts off, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord, a slave, a servant of God, here in chains, Later, and he will say, you know, woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. If Paul didn't do this, he would have just exploded. He was so full of the spirit, he had to act. So he's saying, this is what he wants your prayers to be. Thank you for all of those who pray for me. And I'm sorry that my responses to you are always the same. When you ask, how can I pray for you this week? I pray for health. I pray for love and grace and I pray for strength for the journey because I get tired when you have a worldwide church members of your church are always awake and I want to be there for them as much as I can physically emotionally spiritually yes I take Sabbaths yes there are people around me who work hard to uh, make sure I have Sabbath so um, I'm blessed that way very much so but thank you. My prayers are always, give me wisdom, give me strength for the journey, give me love, because I need to love better than I love. I'm better than I used to be, but it shows me that the road ahead, I got a lot of work to do. Pray that I will declare it fearlessly. And he goes, Tychicus, the, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything. So he's bringing the letter so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers. By the way, that means you two ladies. It's the way language works, or did work. It seems to be changing. And love and with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Somebody write the song about our undying love for an undying Savior. If I was a songwriter, I would. Do it. Don't need to send it to me. Just write it. Start sharing it. All right? I hope you've enjoyed our trip through Ephesians. What could possibly be next? That'll be next week. May God bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and give you peace. You are loved.